we we CTIA about three or four years ago coined a phrase looming spectrum crisis, and I think that sort of has uh, driven us here to some extent. Uh, I, I, I like to take credit for it, but I can only do that when the folks that I work with at CTIA aren't in the room, uh, and they do have to be in the room back there. So, I, so as a team, we came up with the uh, the phrase looming spectrum crisis. And um, I was trying to think of how to put this all in perspective and talk about sort of the wide range of, of, of entities we have represented up here on the panel. And then I realized that since I'm the moderator, I'm just going to make it about the circle of me. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so I, in the last year, have had a number of very personal experiences involving Spectrum and, and the uh, application of, of mobile broadband to, to my life personally. Uh, the first began when my 12-year-old daughter asked for and received her first mobile phone. And uh, for anyone who has a child approaching that age, don't do it. That's all. <laughs> uh, the second was um, uh, a routine visit to GW Hospital resulted in me getting to take home for two weeks a mobile heart monitor, which was great because you could actually take it off and enjoy your life and put it back on. You don't have to run into the hospital every day to get it checked. Uh, everything turned out fine, but it was, it was pretty neat to see this retrofitted device that, uh, and I won't tell you exactly how they made it work through my insurance, but I, I, think, I don't think <laughs> truth was involved. Um, but I had this mod modified wireless device, and I got to experience sort of M, M health from, uh, from a first degree. And sure enough, during that time period when I was wearing the device, I came home, I live in Arlington, Virginia, and there was a little placard hanging on the door that the power company had converted our, our, uh, our uh, meter, energy meter, to a smart grid. Where I was beginning to experience all of the um, all of the verticals, and and then uh, Krista Witnowski joined us, and and we were uh, at CTI, and we were trying to figure out a good product, a project to have her jump into, and we started talking about mobile education, and we asked around about what would be a good school to visit for mobile education, and uh, one of the folks who worked in the Arlington School Board said, well, actually, uh, Jamestown Elementary School, the school my daughters attend is a great school to, to go see. So we actually took a video team out there, visited a fourth grade class, who every week for a double period stacks together a double math class. And the kids are split into four groups. And those four groups get uh, four different mobile devices to work on. And I'll tell you what, you've never heard a quieter class in your lifetime. They move from you know a, a tablet to an iPod to a, a handheld device to, um, uh, to another device, and they, they sort of move back and forth between those four things, both licensed and unlicensed, which is, which is really neat to see. And then perhaps the, the, the one thing that sort of put it all back into perspective, because I think all of those were sort of extensions of the consumer experience. I was actually up in New York uh, about a week or so before we had our trade show in San Diego, and I watched a 20-some-year-old gentleman, the best man at a wedding, deliver his best man speech using his iPhone. And I thought, now that is a really pretty neat application, except for that he had to keep, keep going like this to, to light it back up as he was giving his speech. Um, so I thought, you know, those, those are a number of different ways where I personally have experience. I'm sure everyone in here has, has a range of, of experiences where the application of sort of mobile broadband in your life intersect. And I thought this was a good opportunity for us to talk about, well, how do we facilitate sort of the, the next iteration of mobile broadband? How do we make sure that all of these neat things we couldn't have imagined a few years ago continue to happen? And so instead of starting uh, with an opening speech by each of our five panels, I thought I would introduce them. And then after I introduce them, they're going to be tasked in 20 words or less with sort of defining what they think the, a successful framework should be for, for future U.S. spectrum policies. So I'm going to first give you a quick introduction, and as, uh, as Michelle did earlier, I'm going, to, I'm going to avoid sort of the long introduction, give you a name and title. And if you don't know these people, you really should, should introduce yourselves. This is, this is a, a really a robust group. Uh, to my immediately, immediate left, we have Tom Power. Tom is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Telecommunications with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, to his left is Julie Knapp. Julie is the Chief Engineer at the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC. To Julie's left is Susan Fox. Uh, Susan is the Vice President for Government Relations at the Walt Disney Company. To Susan's left is Kathy Brown. She's the Senior Vice President, Public Policy and Corporate Responsibility at Verizon. And then uh, anchoring the panel in the end is Harold, Fe Harold Fell, the Senior Vice President at Public Knowledge. So, 
I will avoid certain questions about what's going on in the federal government uh, as we speak now outside of the telecom world. But, John, we're going to start with you. In 20 words or less, what, what do you think is the right framework for a successful U.S. spectrum policy? Um, I'm counting. Yeah, well, I, uh, I take these assignments very seriously. Uh, we're, running, we're, we're running low on words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, I can't. I have it. You ready? Continued execution on existing strategies with emphasis on stakeholder collaboration generates innovation, jobs, and productivity. And I have five more. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Is that more or less? <laughs> Julie, Julie, that was good, thank you. Oh, my name is so artful. <laughs> um, I think pra pragmatic solutions that take advantage of some of the more traditional approaches, the you know, reallocations and sharing uh, onto something more interesting and uh, promising ways of getting more out of the spectrum. Okay. Susan. Uh, I'm going to focus on one word, which is both sort of a, a policy and a challenge, which is balance. I work for a pretty big company with a word at the beginning of the content stream and the end of it, and somehow we managed to balance the interests of our production for live sports to what we, our content we distribute over fiber to the content we distribute over the air. And I've been looking at from the user, the viewer perspective, the video, stuff we haven't really talked about today. You combine all those, try to get through the viewer in a way for a variety of ways, and balance all the interests for spectrum. That's the real challenge. Okay. So, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Tom and I came up with the same boss, so we know we have to get this right. Okay, ready? Rationalize currently used spectrum, ensure robust and frictionless secondary markets, taking my fingers, and take yet another look at the efficiency of federal government. Forget ideology. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forget ideology. This is bigger than coasts. This is bigger than commons. And if you just want to say what you've said for the last ten years, please say it to yourself at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like this start. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so not surprised, surprisingly, we did a prep call, and uh, and, and uh, none of this came out during the prep call, by the way. Um, and in that prep call, Julia, and I, I wrote this down, I remember I put quotes around it, but I wrote this down, and you said, I can't imagine any industry in the United States that, that could compete without wireless as part of its strategy. So, um, so I'll start with you, Julia, and we'll mix it up a little bit, um, but Susan, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this. How important is it that we get it right? So Susan, you talked about balance, but Julie, with that statement of yours in mind, how important is it that we get it right, that we, that we have a successful framework and policy in place? Well, it's critically important that we get it right. And the point I was trying to make is that we often focus on you know, smartphones and pads and some of the applications like MTAM and healthcare and smart grid and all those things are important. Uh, what we often lose sight of is importance of wireless to every industry in our economy. You really couldn't imagine whether it's from security to manufacturing, uh, businesses, service industries that all rely on wireless just to be efficient. And it, it's critical not only to us as, uh, within the country, but to compete internationally. Uh, we have to use this technology to be efficient. So I, you know, I think it's really critical to get it right for all of those reasons. Yeah, that's a good time. I, I joke about this, but we, we really, for those of us who work in our company on video issues, we really do start with the viewer. And we haven't talked about the viewer today in this context. We talk a little bit about the consumer, a little bit about the public interest, but it's for us a sense of what does the viewer want. The viewer in our world wants to content where they want it, when they want it, and how they want it, um, which is any number of interests. Um, most traditionally, we're put in a spectral world in the bucket of a, a traditional broadcaster, and it's certainly critically important that our local viewers and our local markets continue to get local news and information, and things like Modern Family, frankly, over the air. Um, at the same time, my, it's important for us that my daughter watches Phineas and Ferb, 
and Mickey Mouse Clubhouse on this, and me and my kids watch Monday Night Football on this. So, um, and there has to be some way of accommodating all those uses, and yet maintaining uh, a vibrant over-the-air transmission at the same time. Harold, let's get to Kathy for one moment. I'll defend getting it wrong. Um, the, more seriously, uh, I am going to defend um, getting something out there that may be less than perfect. Uh, and I think that there's a range of solutions that are right. Uh, I think that uh, sometimes uh, we are so concerned about uh, finding uh, uh, the best possible policy or the single right outcome um, that we get paralyzed. And I think we've got a lot of different things that are happening, potentially on Fed spectrum. Uh, we got to be prepared to take some risks, which means that sometimes we'll be wrong. Uh, and we have to have the, the courage to do that. Uh, and we have to be willing to do it in a time frame that lets us actually learn and correct from those mistakes. Just, it took us a long time to, to learn the D-block was gutsy. And it took us a long time to learn from the D-block and figure out what to do about it. Uh, but uh, I applaud the agency for having taken the chance. And I think as we move into the Fed spectrum space, we've got to be willing to take some chances. And we would therefore be willing to make some mistakes. And Kathy, how, how much time do you spend within Verizon talking about you know, ensuring that, I mean, for those who haven't read uh, Kathy's policy paper, I, I, I think you should take a look at it. It sort of gives you a framework that she boiled down well in the 20 words or less, but gives you a framework, I think, of how Verizon thinks of spectrum planning. Is this something that, that um, absorbs a lot of focus at, at Verizon? Well, just listen to what you just heard. I mean, you heard Julie say that every um, sector of the economy is uh, reliant now on uh, wireless connectivity, and they don't necessarily even know it. They want things to work, and they uh, want um, innovation. That innovation is happening on wireless technologies across the board. Meanwhile, from the consumer side, uh, we know that uh, folks want more and more entertainment, but that's not all. Anywhere, anytime, they also want access to their bank, to their doctor, to their turned out pocketbook, to their wallet, to everything that's in the consumer space. All of that depends on the availability of spectrum. So does a company like Verizon spend time thinking about spectrum planning? Oh, yes. Um, as it spends time thinking about all of its network uh, capabilities, because it must. Uh, the spectrum availability is a bit, it's, spectrum is used for a, a distribution system, right? Behind that, <coughs> I forget, lies all of those fiber uh, cables across the across the ocean, across the world. But the distribution system is becoming more and more around a wireless, no wire, no tethered kind of um, activity that all users want, it doesn't matter where they are. Thus, the government, who has its hands on the spectrum, has to think far and wide about how to plan for this, as does every company in I want to just say first that we believe that uh, the government has done a fairly good job over the last number of years in thinking long term about what the issues are. Putting goals out there, uh, pursuing policies that uh, allow us uh, to get the spectrum in, in the hands of the users. There are, I think, and you're going to find the green with Harold, any number of things we have to keep looking at for the long term because we have to keep how to reuse spectrum that's already out there, how to get it on it, to, to reallocate it if it's been allocated by the governments of the world, how to get it into a market structure so that it can be transferred much more easily, and how the federal spectrum is used more efficiently. And that does not mean, not to say the same thing we said for 10 years, that there aren't other innovative kinds of ways to think about it, but all of the above has to be on the table. And at the same time, lose focus of what is time uh, constrained, if you will. We have to keep putting the spectrum out into the market. And that's the focus we need to have. 
Tom, tell me a little bit about um, sort of how the administration looks at, at, at this and the need to have a uh, sort of a pragmatic, forward-looking spectrum policy. I know we had the president talk about it in the State of the Union, which I think is somewhat unprecedented in our space to have an issue arise, you know, rise up to that level. Um, and I know you were very helpful in that uh, sort of enlightening the, the administration to the importance of this. Is it something that, that, that is talked about, you know, within the White House and, and is there a focus on uh, you know, getting the policy right? Of course, uh, it's huge, and uh, that, you know, for all the reasons that have been stated here, and, and I don't think I've lost in this audience even before this panel. Um, uh, it, it, when you look at across all sectors uh, of the economy, whether it's education or healthcare or manufacturing or transportation or entertainment, you know, it's just tremendously uh, important that we get this right uh, in terms of the economy and jobs, and productivity. Um, I think we are. Uh, very uh, much in favor of the sort of all of the above, as, as Kevin Kathy said. Um, and you see it uh, coming to fruition in a lot of different uh, contexts. Um, Larry Strickling at NCIA has, has helped kick off this uh, uh, process, collaborative process between the agencies and industry and other stakeholders, looking specifically at the 1755 ban. Uh, and and uh, it's hard work, and folks are, are you know, sitting down for hours at a time to to work through these issues and figure out what really are uh, the opportunities there uh, for uh, clearing uh, federal systems out or sharing with uh, the commercial side. And, you know, I dig into it every once in a while to really, you know, keep tabs on things. And, you know, they they are making good progress. They are discovering, uh, you know, uh, it's often assumptions that one side makes that are different than the other side, technical assumptions about, uh, you know, how many users do you assume are within some given radius of a cell tower, and and it, 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 is, it, is it just the number of users, or is it there? You have to figure out what activity are you really engaging in. You could have 100 people with their cell phones out, but that doesn't mean uh, that you assume that they're all using the same data rates at the same time. Um, uh, exclusion zones, you know, where they're finding out that assumptions are vastly different uh, in terms of uh, what kind of protection both the federal side needs, but but what kind of protection, if any. Uh, should run in the other direction. Um, so that that collaborative process is what I was talking about in my 19 or 21 words or whatever it was. Um, and, and I think we're going to need more of that. But we're seeing it too. Um, the, your uh, folks from your industry came in uh, and worked with DOD uh, and, the, and Julie's team to get the uh, special temporary authority to do that testing. DOD worked with the FCC on the medical, uh, uh, the MBAN, the medical uh, body area networks. Um, uh, uh, we have the, I know the TAC at the FCC as well as the GAO are looking at receiver standards. We have the PCAP report uh, really looking at all the levers uh, uh, at play here, and, uh, and they all are important. So I, I think we have a, a range of issues coming up that are going to force us to, to make some, some difficult decisions. Um, and, and I guess one of them, the, the one that's absorbing a fair amount of focus, is the incentive auction. And um, I know, uh, Kathy, you were talking about, you know, we are time constrained to some extent, some of these issues, but we want to make sure we get it right. Harold, you basically said, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? And so how, how do we do that? I think we have Gary and, and Bill and Brett and others here. Um, particularly as we look at the incentive auction process, how do we get that balance right? Is there a balance between being timely, uh, being quick, and, and getting it right? Uh, and, uh, Susan, I'll put you on the spot a little bit because you're, you're on the broadcast side of the equation, but, but uh, as both a uh, broadcaster that very likely will remain in play, but also sort of representing those that may, you know. Yeah, there's two sides to this. One is for the broadcaster who's looking at whether to participate or not, and I feel very strongly broadcasters I believe they're doing and what they should do is that's an individual decision that they're making. I don't think there's a collective mind thing going on. I think individual broadcasters have to look at what, what's on the table and the whole proposal. I think there is with respect to that decision some balancing about complexity so that the individual broadcaster can figure out what their options are um, as far as what, what the economic balance is because at the end of the day it's an economic decision for that individual broadcaster. So additional clarity into that is, is always probably helpful. On the flip side of that, which is where I know we're going to get this done quickly, um, I do have some concern about the, and this is this I think more appropriately is a collective issue where broadcasters are concerned about to be happy. Um, and and I, I see the need, you know, 
know, we, we're, we, we're looking at this by your numbers as well. We've seen the need to move quickly. We know there's an aggressive sense to whatever spectrum is reclaimed to move that, that quickly. I, I will tell you, we were, one thing I really did live through, and Julie said this about five million times, we were on the front lines of the digital transition. And which, which was took an awful lot of planning. We finished, did a tremendous job with it. But we had the three stations really in the country that were the most disproportionately impacted. Um, the most, most, most few stations in the country, WABC on a channel that at the end of the day wasn't sufficient. Uh, WPPI in Philadelphia, WLS in And we received literally thousands of things. So there is, you know, I, I, I get the need for speed, but I also get the need for looking at where the viewers are and making sure they're stirred. So and Julie, to his credit, has made a commission after the, commission, after the transition really did step in and help us significantly power increases and otherwise, but there has to be some look back and correction uh, to make sure that where there is demand for, uh, in a local market is addressed. Sure. And how about on the forward side, Kathy, the auction? So I don't disagree with this, and I think our memories are very short in Washington. How long did it take us to get through the, the DTV transition? And I think we were all sitting yeah. at the table a few years. We did the, the 97 order was the recon, and the transition itself was in 2009. So I'm optimistic, actually. Let's just think about the fact that we actually got this legislation through this last time, that it is actually at the FCC. There, there is actually a notice out. Applause, applause from where I sit. Sure. Okay. I think I didn't say speed. I said focus. And I think I was very careful to say focus. I think the focus will bring the right balance. What I always get concerned about, because we are who we are in this town, is that we get our focus went another way uh, because events happen. And this is an undertaking that is uh, astounding in some respects, this auction. I give folks a lot of credit. I've done a lot of learning myself and thinking and listening about how this happens and happens well. I'm convinced it can be done. Uh, no, no. War stories, but I remember, you know, each time that the next phase of auction came on, there were many doubters, and I seen people in the United States in a collaborative way work through the next way. I have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to do it. That doesn't mean it's not complex, and it doesn't mean that when you have a buyer and seller market that's going to be a simultaneous market that there aren't challenges here that are going to take some uh, working through. But if we focus. And if uh, it's clear that this will be done, and it will be done on a schedule, uh, then I think that we're more likely to get there than if we lose folks. Uh, so when I say fast, I mean six months. None of us think that. But we also don't want to be where we were in the TV transition and find that uh, the date's been moved for, let's say, 10 more years. We don't want that. We can't. We can't and Julie, are you confident that, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here, that Gary and his team can deliver? <laughs> what do you think, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, 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 no. no, no. no but, but I think one of the things that we're trying to do is have a process that's simple for the participants in the end. And the complexity, Gary's used the term, it's, it's complicated under the hood. So you, you get in your car and you can drive it, you don't know how all the systems and all of the engineering that went into it. You just know it works. And, and that's the thing we're trying to do through our list. Yeah, it's complicated when you get into the details of how the repacking works and, and so forth. But we've tackled complicated things before. So there's no reason to shy away or to suspect that we won't be successful in the end. I have every confidence that we will. Harold. Um, a couple of things about incentive auctions, um, which I grant moves us away from the, the federal spectrum stuff unless we're thinking we're going to do internal <coughs> options for federal spectrum at some point, which might not be a bad idea if this works out, but just a couple of quick things. One, I think the single worst thing that Congress did in this statute was to say there will be only one because we're going to learn a lot from running the incentive auction. Um, and to have limited it to a single incentive auction so that all broadcasters must make a decision. You're in now, you're out. 
and all wireless carriers need to make a decision. You want to buy 600 megahertz spectrum now when we have no technology for this at the moment and no idea how it's going to integrate uh, into your current networks puts added pressure uh, on this. I think that in terms of the time frame that we're talking about, uh, I think one of the more useful things actually that could happen is to see a lot more work being done on what 600 megahertz receivers and transmitters would look like. Um, because uh, I give credit to the team that put together a way to devise a band plan given the huge number of unknowns that had to go into devising that band plan. And I think the modular stuff that they came up with is probably a, you know, is, is, is a very clever approach. But um, we're learning a lot about 700 megahertz spectrum right now. And uh, including uh, you know, its strengths and its weaknesses that we never imagined in 2008. And we had 10 years to think about how that was uh, uh, all going to hang together. The last thing I just got to point out about incentive auction is there are a lot more stakeholders than just the full power broadcasters and the you know, wireless carriers who are going to bid. Um, we have uh, a lot of folks who are uh, developing the TV white spaces technology. Uh, there are public safety uh, uh, aspects, not just the people who are using FirstNet, but also uh, in the repacking. Um, we uh, have uh, low power uh, television uh, folks who often provide important uh, um, diverse uh, programming, particularly with regard to uh, Spanish language uh, and other uh, underrepresented linguistic minorities. There's a lot of work in parts here. I didn't even touch on wireless microphones. Um, there's a lot of work in parts here, uh, and I think that uh, we, we cannot underestimate that challenge, even if we believe, and I think we should believe, as, as Kathy pointed out, the fact that it's complicated doesn't mean we can't do it, and we ought to go into this believing that we will do it and do it successfully. So let's talk a little bit about government spectrum. Uh, we'll get back to some of the repurposing of commercial spectrum, but on the government side, um, a lot of energy has been spent sort of looking at and, and responding to the PCAST report. Um, I, think, I think one of the things, I know one of the things that, that that troubled me was not, not in essence, the content per se of the report, but how it was presented that the, the new norm should be sharing. How, how do we look at sort of the, that, that balance between clearing and sharing? And Tom, I'll start, start with you a little bit to talk about how the report was framed within the administration and how you view it and, and how that will, will sort of play into our efforts uh, going forward. So, and, you know, the first thing that we noticed is the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, not part of the administration here, advisors that are uh, uh, recruited to give good advice, and, and, and they did give good advice, and uh, just making the technical point that it's not part of the administration. Um, that being said, I, I think they, they put their finger on an obvious problem, which is that the uh, spectrum is finite, and demands are increasing on the commercial side, demands are increasing on the federal side, and at some point, at some point, uh, you know, we're going to have to be uh, looking at way. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, this, the whole debate over spectrum sharing, I think, has gotten uh, heated in ways that, that are not necessary, because I, I don't think anybody is, is advocating a complete shift away. And I think, you know, the work that's going on now in the 755 band is, is the exact, exact the kind of work we need, we need to keep doing. And then uh, uh, following up in other bands after we're done there, because that's where you're going to find out what really is the art of the possible in terms of uh, what's available, whether that means clearing or sharing or some of both, which I think is often the case. Um, so I, 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 you know, Harold pointed out how we have a lot of this sort of rhetorical back and forth in the, in the press and so forth, but I think uh, the hard work uh, really is being done and really will be successful. And, and uh, now there will be, you know, technological advances, there, there always are, and that's going to be part of the solution too. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think we need to be debating this as a need or kind of thing. It's, it's uh, all about Harold? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things here that a lot of people tend to miss in this debate. One is, for me, the biggest lesson of the spectrum policy in 2011 and 2012 is DOD is still master of their spectrum. Uh, Light squared got tanked by DOD, um, and DOD pulled everything they didn't like out of the uh, spectrum legislation. Um, 
CBO ranked the probability of getting 1755 to 1850 out of the hands of the military as zero and gave it no score um, when it was in the bill. Um, and I think that as we look at the PCAS report, one of the things that animates this is we need to have some realistic expectation about how you move the military. And that's going to happen over time. And I think ultimately the solution to finding ways to migrate DOD off of spectrum that they have right now um, is to demonstrate that sharing is possible, including sharing among federal users. And that if we have a band which, for a variety of reasons, uh, is most efficiently distributed by auction, uh, and I think 1755 uh, may uh, qualify for that given the global equipment market harmonization, um, then the only way you're going to get access to that is to find some way to have spectrum sharing in other bands so that its current users are comfortable in migrating out and we can do that affordably. Kathy, in your paper you talked to, uh, you sort of almost uh, bifurcated PCAS's version of sharing into <coughs> temporal and geographic on one side and future looking cognitive intelligence. You want to talk a little bit about how you do that? Um. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me uh, sharing is an issue, and then uh, the PF report is an issue. And, and as I said to Tom, he's had to listen to my speech on this. My problem with the report is the first three chapters weren't there, in my view. It's like, did we actually take a look to see what these assignments are about anymore? And um, who has a sector? What, what are they doing with it? And um, can it be done more efficiently? Now, I know everybody's throwing their hands up and saying, but it felt like we got to a solution without actually having a problem except assume uh, uh, there's no data that says here's the issue. So that was my issue with that. However, the recommendations in my mind are an R and D kind of recommendation <coughs> in that respect. It's something I think that we all are reasonably rationally thinking, well, we can look. What we can't do is lose focus on what we have to do now. So that was what, what we said very clearly. Now with respect to sharing, um, there's time and there's use and there's place. We are right now very engaged in the work on the 1755, 1850. Uh, um, and it's moving along fairly well with very good cooperation. It's uh, T and us and uh, T-Mobile are there together with the government trying to sort out how to think about this, how to test it, what it means if you could come up with some sort of way to use it, what would that look like, how would that work. Um, Verizon was the first to put $5 million on the table to say, let's go forward, we have to start thinking this way. So neither thing is exclusive of the other, and I think sometimes we get ourselves you know, wrapped up in our rhetoric around what it is we have to do to be responsible to think about long-term use. And Julie, do you think it's um, feasible to try to consider this effort on behalf of the industry and government in, 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 a, in time to try to pair it with the 2155 to 2180? Do you think that's the right target to, to at least shoot for? But that's the goal because we have a clock ticking on the AWS3 spectrum that would be the best connected set. Uh, and I think through the uh, C-SPAN process and the working groups, they're trying to target uh, recommendations by early next year. Uh, so that, that's the goal, to at least have an indication of whether we think this can work, and if so, would it work for each side, both the incumbents and the newcomers? Okay, I'm going to jump back for a moment and talk a little bit about uh, as we begin to, to think about developing a framework for spectrum policy, I think when we began this effort five years ago, we didn't have verticals that I talked about at the beginning. We didn't have the video usage. Susan, you talked a little bit about how, how do we you know, include those changes uh, going forward? And then I'm going to ask you sort of a longer, how do we future-proof what we're doing? Because I don't think we have a real sense of where, of where these uses are going how much it can change in the next five years. So I'm going to start, Susan, with you as a content company who's looking at a delivery vehicle, um, but potentially also looking at other uses of mobile broadband. 
Yeah, and I think one of the great things about entertainment is that although it's very fluffy and light, it, it does drive a lot. We're hoping that it actually does drive adoption. Um, and that the fact that people actually want to watch sports and entertain their kids when they're in their doctor's waiting room will end up uh, putting devices in people's hands who ultimately use them for other purposes and other articles. Um, Future proofing is, is very tough. I will tell you how, uh, how we conceived it, which is to try to define how our viewers and users want to get our content as far away as possible. And we sort of joke, uh, in, in all devices now are ever met, um, however that may mean. Um, we only view, frankly, the capacity to, to view video is growing. Um, a lot of people ask us, by way of example, don't you, haven't you found that, say, we, we, ABC was the first network to put our shows on iTunes, the first network to have our own media player. And when we did that, there were questions about whether that was going to take away viewership from the mothership. And to be very clear, the mothership is, is critically important and, and drives a lot of revenue. But it turns out that even fans of shows like Modern Family will like, only watch a handful of episodes a season. And that a lot of the viewing that's being done on these devices is actually bringing folks back uh, to the traditional platform, and it's all cumulative. So um, I, our approach is not to hesitate, to be bold. Um, I don't know that anybody can future-proof, but to try to conceive of getting devices and content to people wherever they are is the way we're conceiving. Other thoughts? Sure. I mean, just to say that the President of the United States talks about RTE, that's pretty darn good there. <laughs> so I think we're moving to, and we keep moving to the next technology, to the next technology, to the next technology, and we've now moved to the next technology where we're finding we're foot, we're foot faster. serve as a phone network um, is architected in a very different way and people have very different expectations about it than say a Wi-Fi cloud that is hooked into your cable system. Um, nevertheless, as we just saw in uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, the, the folks who came out of that providing the greatest wireless functionality in the shortest time were Verizon, which has you know, probably one of the best engineered uh, uh, networks. And then Comcast with its Wi-Fi because it was flexible and there, and sometimes being flexible and there is what you need. Uh, I think that uh, when we talk about the Internet of Things, a lot of the Internet of Things is the kind of traffic that fits on unlicensed, um, where you have consider the trade-offs. You have you know flexibility of architecture, peer-to-peer -peer type uh, uh, architecture is easy to manufacture, um, 
but it also got to be robust enough traffic that uh, if you start dropping packets, um, it's not uh, a catastrophe. Uh, by contrast, when you're talking about uh, you know the need to connect to 911 in emergencies, um, you probably uh, are still looking to have licensed uh, spectrum, uh, and that's going to play an important role in the mix. I think the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is that carriers are uh, um, now freely mixing. Um, they're uh, licensed and unlicensed, and they're uh, licensed that they're putting in a small cell architecture which mirrors uh, what had traditionally been a more Wi-Fi type uh, architecture because they've discovered where that's more efficient. And I think the deficiency we have right now on the federal side is that federal users are still broken up and isolated and thinking of themselves as single users stuck using 20-year-old technology, 30-year-old technology in some of these cases, um, where if we attempted to aggregate federal use where we could and have some consideration of how the federal government as a whole could genuinely be a more efficient user uh, and tap into some of these more flexible uh, uh, technologies, we would see an enormous uh, uh, increase in uh, efficiency of federal use, which would make more spectrum available for commercial use. So let's, let's jump back for a moment and talk a little bit about uh, other ways of rationalizing or repurposing spectrum. I know, Kathy, you talked a little bit about secondary markets in your paper, and it was mentioned uh, earlier today as well. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about the role that, that secondary markets can play in, in making sure that the, you know, the companies that will put the spectrum to its highest and best use get access to it? Well, I think that the fact that one can actually, that there is a secondary market, we applaud again the U.S. to for ensuring that that's happening and that it is indeed robust. And it, it is every day there are trades that go on and by any actual financial uh, arrangement by which people are able to move the spectrum around. And the more that can be done frictionlessly, that means without a lot of intrusion by the government, frankly, under rules that are fair, the better that's going to be in order to make sure it's put to use for its best use at any particular time. Um, and I think as we uh, move, for instance, after this uh, instead of auction, that it would be worth thinking about what it means once that spectrum has been repackaged, resold, and all that. What does that mean for a robust secondary market? Or are we going to, again, face uh, a whole next round of let's figure out what the next thing is we have to do for the government to do? Or are we going to think through the policy as to what happens with that now available existing use spectrum as new players come on? And uh, sure, you can see uh, the commission is proposing to auction licenses in, in a fungible way that could end up bringing a fair amount of spectrum to market, secondary market basis. You know, there's another way to sort of look at the, the secondary markets. In the broadcast space, um, I think the government, uh, the FCC, quickly realized that they needed to be an aggregator to actually squeeze out some of the, the greatest deficiencies of, of reallocating and repackaging the broadcast licenses. But we've seen a number of different approaches, and Julie, I'm going to throw this to you, um, some recent examples of company-specific efforts to, to repurpose spectrum, whether it's the um, Dishes MSS efforts that before the commission, uh, I think we saw today that Global Star put a filing in along the same lines. Uh, we saw AT&T working with, with Sirius XM in, in that space. Um, and I think Peter called it earlier ad hocery, but, but this ad hocery approach, um, TM, sorry, that's right, I, did, I wrote TM, I didn't say it. Apologize, TM. Um, what role will this sort of approach, and this approach that ultimately often ends up in front of the commission to, to pass judgment on, uh, you know, what role will that have or should it have in spectrum policy going forward? So, um, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution. So when I started out saying the pragmatic is uh, very compelling, because each of those situations presented a different set of circumstances. And if our end objective was, well, how can we maximize the use out of that spectrum? Uh, that, and, and that's what I think uh, we, we've tried to do or are trying to do or look at some of these things are pending. Uh, and and it, it does seem to me that in other places that you look at the characteristics of the spectrum and the licensees and all those and you decide what makes sense here to get more use out of it. Yeah, I think we saw, uh, Mike, Mike was uh, 
concerned or complaining earlier about the speed with which some of these things move. I think the WCS and SDAR sat for quite some time until you know the, the private companies got together and tried to negotiate. So, so let me give a <coughs> shot to that. Um, I, for, for, first of all, it really resonated with that so people have short memories because many of these big issues that uh, we dealt with before, whether it was coming up with the PCS spectrum, I remember being in the first workshop and talking about this and spoke about a risk radio. <laughs> and it was in 89. We did the auction in 96, it was seven years later. That's our time. When we talked about for the what became the AWS uh, one spectrum was IMT 2000, and the meetings began in 1990. <laughs> so I'm not advocating that these things, it's okay to, to be slow, but sometimes what happens is over time, as long as we're continuing to make these investments and they bear fruit on an ongoing basis, uh, we're, we're, we are doing the right thing in bringing spectrum to market. There are often technical <laughs> solutions, sorry, hold on, yeah, no, that don't show up on the first couple of rounds. And so with WCS SDAR is one of the things that happened. We moved to a point where it suddenly became less concerning to look at a complete wide area network as much as where to, how can I get capacity in the places that I need it. And once you started to think about the problem that way, it led to different kinds of solutions that both sides could agree to. There was another element with WCS starts too, which is AT&T was blocked from taking over Timba. Um, and the result of that was their spectrum needs suddenly became much more acute. Uh, and <coughs> I do think that uh, uh, one of the things that happens in times of shortage uh, is that people become more innovative. And uh, uh, you know, if we want to borrow from the energy uh, uh, industry, um, we're suddenly getting a lot more oil out of shale and we're getting a lot more natural gas out because when the price went up enough, people got very clever about technology and worked really hard about it and solved problems that had been sitting around for 30 years. Now, as environmentalists will tell you, sometimes there are unworthy consequences of that. Um, we've got to confront the fact that we're in a reality that is going to be constantly changing, um, that in some cases that's going to have positive effects like WCSS DARS, where solutions that hadn't been feasible before because the need wasn't as pressing and because the technology wasn't there, um, you know, become available. And we're also going to have a lot of places where the change in the environment is going to create uh, friction uh, among licensees between users of licensed and unlicensed technologies. Um, and to circle back to a question about future proofing, we're never going to future proof this. We have to learn to be comfortable with the fact that um, as we evolve, the needs are going to evolve, the technology is going to evolve, and that means, sad for some people in this room, happy for others, there will always be a need for the FCC and for federal involvement in making sure that the pieces actually still move together. Okay, thank you for the segue. Um, Tom, how do we ensure that the pieces still move together? <laughs> uh, you know, as we look, so we've really been sort of to looking at some extent at, at what is the right uh, plan for you know commercial or industry based spectrum management but you know the big elephant in the room is how do we ensure that, uh, that the non-mobile broadband use of spectrum going forward is considered in, in part of this plan uh, whether it's you know DOD or satellite uses or sort of all the range of uses we're seeing right now how do we ensure that they're sensible rational and, and well thought of and not just you know, following the norm because it's the norm. Um, you know, I, I think Carol nailed it. it, it you can't, you can't, you can't be certain. Uh, uh, you, you can't devise a plan today that you can be certain is going to be successful for years to come in this field. Uh, you know, when you look at the changes in the use of spectrum just in the last five years, ten years, twenty. I mean, it's just spectacular to me. Nobody, nobody is coming, and there's no reason to think that's going to change. I think. Um, uh, you know, one of the fact, one of the uh, statistics that the PCAST pointed to is the Defense Department's use of unmanned aerial systems. That was 100 systems or 150 systems in 2000 and 7,500 systems in 2010. Um, I was just um, uh, talking to a guy uh, about the use of spectrum in manufacturing where uh, you, you make these, um, say, engines or other components of arrangements where uh, they have these machines, these sensors that that detects slight imperfections in 
one part, and then another machine is making the, the separate part that's going to connect together, it, it can match up the sort of corresponding imperfections. Yep. And how do you, and then getting the data back and forth between these two, what are essentially two robots, um, you know, it's like, it's, it, it's amazing the, the things that are coming forward. So I think we just, think we have to be flexible. The last thing you want, I think, is anybody, certainly not the government, saying, oh, we've got the answer, and here's how we're going to live for the next five and ten or twenty years. I think we all have to be flexible. There will be uncertainty, uh, and there, and there, I think, does have to be a role for the government to, uh, to help sort of that. Truly, thoughts? Well, the, there are lots of other needs besides mobile wireless. They are all important and legitimate. Uh, often, I think we talk at very high level on the policy standpoint without, when you get down into the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts of so these things, it's just not so simple. So when you start to look at, and I'll throw out an example, so 2700 to 2900, and uh, when we sat down with NTIA and went through, well, what are the places to look at? And just to give you an idea of how tough all of the challenges are. So you look and you say, well, what's there? Oh, that's the next red weather radars. That's the pretty pictures that we all look at to see where the storm's coming in. So, well, okay, what can we do with this? Um, so could you relocate them? Where would they go? <laughs> can you do without them? What do you mean, do without them? <laughs> uh, well, could we shave 20 megahertz off each end? I don't know, maybe. It'd take us redesign of all the existing stuff. It'd take us 20 years to do it at a cost of X billion dollars. Say, well, we ought to plan for that. Well, I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think what makes some of the other services anxious is all of the focus on uh, mobile wireless. And, and so they say, particularly on the federal side, what about us? We've got needs too. And uh, I think it's incumbent on the entire sector to, to try, don't look just at your own problem, but try to look at you know, how, how do you solve these things? because they are very real problems. And uh, if you can't figure a way to solve them, you're not going to get anywhere, and the solutions will be so far down the pike, they're not going to be an answer to the problem. Yeah, just, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about incentives for agencies. Sometimes the incentives work exactly backwards. I mean, uh, no doubt agencies could do a better job of, of uh, using spectrum more efficiently if they spent money on upgrading systems. But so now you have the tug of the budget against the tug of the spectrum efficiency. Uh, very tough to serve and, and uh, to solve. And, and the issue of agency incentives, of course, goes back. Uh, people have been struggling, struggling with this for quite a while because you, you, Harold talked about perhaps uh, incentive auctions for uh, for uh, agencies. But you know, the problem is it, that's it, it's not like we're going to say, well, you've saved a bunch of spectrum. We're going to give you a pot of money to do whatever you want with, right? It's like the DOD gets the tanks if they need the tanks, and they don't get the tanks if they don't need the tanks. It's not like here's a little slush fund you can go to which you want with it. And that's really been uh, the challenge we've never quite been able to Well, you, you may read in the, in the paper tonight or tomorrow that Commissioner Rosenworth will propose to actually taking some money from the auction and, and reimbursing uh, you know, some of the government agencies as, I, as part of an effort. So I, no, I, 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 I think there's, there may be a solution there. I, I just don't think anyone's quite figured it out yet. Yeah. And Chris, let's get coming for a minute. I'm Julie and Harold talking about the balance of existing users and users and new users and licensed and, and unlicensed and two communities that, that on the content side in stage one of content uh, before you goes out <coughs> transmission that I work a lot with so on the wireless mic community and the broadcast auxiliary spectrum which is a spectrum that's used when you see the news trucks running around the street um, and, and there we have shared actually for a long time it's largely because of uh, the work of folks who volunteer to do frequency coordination and those are communities we're nervous about combining licensed and unlicensed users because they have the coordination of work because they know each other. Um, and frankly, like last night in Pittsburgh, we did Monday Night Football, we used, I think, 40 UHF channels to get over 12 TV channels, 40 UHF frequencies over 12 different TV channels to get that production going. So those are the folks that when they see the, the repacking coming, and, and those are the community, two communities are already dealing with less spectrum today than they were five years ago, and, I, and the message is there's always going to be less, get more efficient, and they're working, um, but it is a challenge for them because it's not worth it when next, I actually forget where my, next week's Monday Night Football game is, but if there's interference in Pittsburgh last night, they're not going <coughs> to stick around and figure out what the source of the interference was. 
There's an appearance in the Jersey Shore last week when they were covering Hurricane Sandy. They're not going to stick around to figure out what the source of it was. And then if it's not licensed, it's going to take a long time. So there are challenges that where people say go slowly, you know, that's, that's some of the rationale behind those concerns. Sure. So questions from the audience? Yes, sir. There's a microphone right back to your
uh, doing something else, doing mobile wireless, doing some future technology. And so it may, so part of what I wonder is whether sharing or sub-leasing spectrum, is that really an opportunity for small broadcasters, for small entrepreneurs? I don't know. So it would be, it's, it's more about what's the opportunity for small entrepreneurs. We in public knowledge have certainly thought that the uh, sharing spectrum uh, creates enormous opportunities for uh, new entrants and entrepreneurs. Uh, now, sometimes when we say new entrants, that turns out to mean Comcast, Time Warner Cable, and, and you know, other people who are new to this space. Um, but we are also seeing um, you know, that uh, this creates uh, an enormous uh, uh, set of opportunities, sometimes out of traditional <coughs> carrier space, uh, smart meters and iTron, for example, particularly with regard to the question of women-owned businesses and, and communities of color, um, and also particularly with regard to content, uh, distribution of content, uh, I think that there are um, tremendous opportunities there. Um, the issues that uh, arise are, one, um, what's the object of the exercise? Um, it is very different if you are a content producer who is from a community that has been traditionally marginalized and says, I'm losing low power television. Um, how am I going to get uh, things out there that serve my community? Uh, and how am I going to do it in a way that uh, reaches my people where they live as opposed to uh, just put something on the internet and help people find it? Uh, I do think that there are opportunities there and that there are some people who are doing exciting things and uh, that we need to be thinking about. It. I think that. Uh, um, there are opportunities uh, in licensed as well, but these are enhanced a tremendous amount by the presence of unlicensed uh, uh, spectrum and the possibilities for spectrum sharing. Um, so I certainly hope that uh, uh, communities of color and uh, um, women-owned businesses and others will take a very careful look at uh, spectrum sharing uh, as a uh, means of uh, developing new opportunities or expanding uh, the existing uh, lines <coughs> Other questions? Yes. How would a discussion of expansion of high-speed wireline to the end user change the conversation that we just listened to? It's provider of both. Yeah. Is it provider of both? Yeah. I would say that um, Consumers use both, and they use both in different ways. And I myself have five <laughs> um, and we use it uh, uh, consuming uh, football yeah. games, etc., at, at a ridiculous amount of time. <laughs> However, in Cyberpunk, interestingly, we're using a lot of wireless, aren't we? Because at the same time, we're on that big fiber that's being used all over the house. So interestingly, so. Um, however, if you look at the usage in our house, which I assume is um, not necessarily typical, but not untypical, there's probably six or eight wireless devices at the same time that there's a Wi-Fi going on with respect <coughs> to the, the um, fiber. So I actually think that um, consumers like both. What's interesting is the investment with respect to each. And um, I was looking a lot about the, around this in the developing world, for instance, uh, with respect to what the leapfrog technology will be after years and years of really not, of this long debate about running fiber to communities. And it turns out that this LTE uh, technology is going to be the leapfrog technology at 10, 11, 12, maybe 30 megabits uh, per second. Now, it's going to be interesting to watch how this goes and then to watch how usage goes. Um, but long, long answer to give us some questions. I think AT&T actually just answered this question in a very interesting and compelling way. Um, one of the, uh, to me, as just wearing my geek hat for a moment, um, uh, exciting things about uh, the AT&T announcement, in addition to all of the you know 
terrifying things about the AT&T announcement, um, is that it's an effort to totally integrate wireline um, and small cell architecture and wireless into a seamless all IP network that involves probably the most significant new investment in DSL technology um, that we have seen in the country in years. Uh, and uh, I am, uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, this is going to uh, have broader impact uh, and show that wireline and wireless work synergistically together. One of the biggest issues in the Verizon Spectrum Co. Uh, fight was about Wi-Fi offload um, and how um, you know, the, the cable operators uh, are potentially changing their role and how others uh, with networks may potentially change their role. Uh, with regard to federal spectrum, I think that absolutely one of the questions we ought to be having with regard to the efficiency of federal spectrum uh, is the federal government has a lot of fiber in the ground. Um, and we ought to be asking, you know, what if we, uh, um, what if we persuaded Congress to actually invest some money uh, in uh, upgrading federal wireless architecture uh, as opposed to that we took advantage of all of these assets uh, rather than continue with our current structure, which is to uh, have every agency that needs to uh, uh, do something wirelessly get an allocation from NTIA and figure it out for themselves. Looks like we've uh, we've run out of time. So if you could join me in thanking our panel.